Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're watching and listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, I have a dear friend of long, long acquaintance, Eve Lorgan, uh, to share with us her, her insight about all things cosmic uh, spiritual warfare related, uh, geopolitics, and living near the epicenter of where so much of the uh, geoengineered warfare has been meted out. A quick point about that. It seems to me almost as if uh, America is being segmented, divided up almost into FEMA regions with these quote-unquote disasters here, these wildfires so-called here, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's like if I didn't know any better, parts of America were being segmented or isolated from other parts. And a quick comment about uh, the election that just passed. Uh, I think that most people that have any uh, self-worth and uh, basic common sense, uh, there's a sense of relief that the the whack job uh, sadistic clown show uh, did not win the election. Uh, for, for those, there's always going to be the glass half empty types uh, i'll call them in, in this instance uh, moderate liberals at least they're not the foaming of the mouth variety they're still griping and complaining and bitching about the results of the election which tells me that maybe they're not so moderate liberal after all because anyone who complains about the outcome especially truthers so-called who are always bitching about how everyone's a controlled up and everything is a psyop. Anyone who complains about the results of the election, it means they don't believe in the will of the people. This is what the people wanted. The people are tired of immigrants stabbing them and shooting them and getting all these benefits. They're tired of the prices of everything mm -hmm. going up. Even though Trump may not be able to make a, a wave a magic wand and change this, okay, instantly or otherwise, this is what the people wanted. This is what the people wanted four years ago before that was stolen. Okay. So that's just my thoughts about it. I mean, breathe a sigh of relief. We're still on the brink of nuclear war. No time to be complacent. It's time actually to put the pedal to the metal. To that end, I have dear friend Evie Lorgan. And Evie was there pretty much at the epicenter. You don't have to give an exact location of where you're at, Eve, but if you wouldn't mind, uh, welcome to the show again and, and tell us about uh, the recovery efforts of your your neck of the woods. Well, it's good to have have me on and speak with you again, James. It's always a pleasure. Um, yeah, there has been so much going on that has culminated with a lot of chaos, probably in different regions, you know, of the country and of the world and, you know, the elections. But if I, where I am in Western North Carolina, this is where um, we had the Hurricane Helene, which is really, they said it was a tropical storm, but it was much more because we had a lot of heavy rain even two days before the, the big kahuna moved in and with the high winds and everything and even more rain. So we got a lot of flooding and yeah, so it's been a, a mess, but in my neighborhood specifically, I was lucky not to have a lot of damage. I, I had cracked trees and some flooding areas across my yard, but I prepared for it. But I thought it was interesting because I even knew two days before the storm that I wanted to prepare. There was no sandbags to even um, sandbag up the areas of my home that would need it if there was flooding. So I had to jimmy rig things with uh, like bags of soil and big water jugs and, you know, pieces of you know old flooring that I had used from a bathroom job and like placing it against the what do you call the trap door of the what we call the crawl space of our home. <laughs> so I had to do all that and just kind of reinforce it and just hope that it would hold and, and all the other areas that look like they would need it. So luckily that worked and I was really glad because the water did raise up enough to have flooded the crawl space of my home. So, and I have a well and a septic tank. So there's always the concern of different kinds of contamination and, but really it was, it was the blocked roads and the power outage and the cell phone outage, and the internet outage, and no water, and for days on end. Um, but luckily, I had a generator, and I'm just kind of going off here because it actually it was really stressful. 
I had PTSD and I'm like, man, you know, I study these things all the time about trauma. And I'm like, I, I have PTSD, you know, this is like, and I didn't even, it wasn't even bad for me compared to what I heard um, about others. Um, and I think it's just the, when you see the damage that like, well, mother nature that she can do in like really big, like huge trees, like completely rooted up with big old roots and clumps of soil and, you know, streets blocked and wires hanging all over the places and, you know, floods that look like friggin' lakes. And, and then like, I had three major roads that were blocked. So for three days we couldn't go out because there was a flood on this end from a river, a flood on that end from a river and a flood on that end from a flooded road. So we couldn't go anywhere. But luckily, we were able to to move around. After like three days, I was able to uh, pick up my mom and take her to my home so that we could have a a place together to to deal with this. Because once the the food spoils in the fridge, and then you don't know if you could like she was on municipal water, which is lucky because some people they still have running water, but then you don't know if it's contaminated. So um, so then you could no longer do cooking or drinking or or washing. Um, because of contamination issues. And so then it becomes like, I don't know what I'm going to do today. I don't know how I'm going to do what I need to do today. So every day was just like, well, spontaneous, you know, this is what I'm going to do today. If I can't do this, that or the other, I can do this. And so just working with neighbors and working with spontaneous, you know, faith that something's going to work out. And thank God, I mean, I feel really lucky that um, I feel like my prayers worked. I feel like my dream warnings worked. Um, but I was still surprised at the level of PTSD that I'm still experiencing from not only hearing about what our friend, um, our friend Craig, who actually visited me um, on his way back from his rescue operation with a team from another part of the state. And so they went up to an area that's about an hour north of me in Burnsville, which is, you know, you know north of Asheville. So a lot of the, the areas that got hit real bad tended to be um, the more hilly and the more closer to rivers or streams or where there were uh, mudslides and landslides and just rivers that had overflown over, over like, flooded like more than like eight to 10 feet. You're talking about eight to 20 to 30 feet of floodwaters where it just takes out entire roads and trees and cars and houses. And then so, but then the water did recede. But when you see where the water receded, and what tree clumps and all that garbage that's left and what's in the garbage, which I don't know if Craig told me, and I've heard this on the internet, I didn't see it personally, but you know, the dead bodies and the parts and the dead things and things you, and then just missing people, lots of missing people and missing animals. And, you know, and uh, so that was, um, yeah, that was disturbing to know there's all these people who just, didn't make it. And I was watching a video. I'm, I'm going to, I won't talk about this so much, but um, just to get it off my chest, because I just to keep up on the locals, like the local ministries had helped me clean up cracked trees in my yard for free, which was fantastic. So there's really good people who are doing wonderful things, who are mostly locals and people who are not part of the government per se. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. It was just... <sighs> But I went, I went to the FEMA Center for help just to ask, but it, you can't really get help unless you lost your home or something for like lodging or something. So you really can't get what you need if you lost a lot. So, uh, and now I, I can't even remember what I was going to say. It was just that the, the PTSD when going in the, um, the center where you like wait and then they put you through these different stations, you know, to sign up for, you know, the FEMA and do their application with their people and then go through the different, you know, tables set up, um, and it's a feeling that you get, like, if, if you're not aware, um, that you pick up all the energies of the other people. And so you pick up the energies of the people who've lost it all, who've had deaths, um, who are just scared. And so I just, like, all of a sudden I just felt like crying and just, like, running out of there. And it was, like, this overwhelming feeling of, um, yeah, that. So that then I realized this is just kind of like an egregore of the feelings of people when they go through a disaster. It's still like this big cloud that's surrounding the area because there's still like, I had to buy a Starlink. I still don't have internet. I still don't have adequate cellular to, there's only like one bar or two bars. So it's not adequate and um, had to pay out of pocket a lot of things just to make do with what I had. So really there's a lot of losses in this area, like economically, 
um, and the home repairs that the insurance companies won't cover. I mean, I don't need to go into it. It's just the realization of um, when those kind of things hit, our only, our best efforts are if we can prepare and if we have friends that we meet in our neighborhood who are willing to help one another. So that's, that's the good thing because there was a lot of people who were just really willing to help and who made it worthwhile, you know, to just feel safe, you know. You talked about the trauma. I've had Steve LaPlume on the show, and Steve was, uh, you know, he's a combat veteran. He's a, a veteran of Rendlesham Forest, which in itself is traumatizing. He had what it amounted to a, a missing time abduction experience and a bunch of other things that happened in his life. But he told me, and he said on my show, that he was in Thailand, if memory serves, uh, either during or in the aftermath of uh, the Boxing Day tsunami, if you remember that. And uh, he said I, the words that came out of him were like trauma, traumatizing. It was, you know, the scenes of utter devastation. And there is, or probably perhaps more than one mountain town in North Carolina that had been completely washed away. I mean, I've seen before and after pictures and it just makes me wonder, it, because they would have 3D topographical models, and so they would know which places were flood prone, which places to easily inundate and flood, what have you. To me, it's clear it, it's, it was geoengineered because it's over 300 miles inland from the ocean, and they're supposed to lose power, but it didn't it intensify it as it got over a mountain range. I wonder also if they had done as they had done in the past open the sluices of dams uh, to allow more water to come down. We, we know that weather weaponry has been used. There have been times, uh, there was a time in Pakistan uh, several years ago when just a ridiculous amount of rain came in in a very short period of time and just wiped out thousands and thousands of people. To me, that smacked of, of weather weaponry to have that much rain dumped, uh, you know, in a huge area of Pakistan they have the means to do this. So uh, you wanted to make a point about trauma as well. So I'll, I'll give the floor back to you, E.B. Well, it's that, you know, I didn't think I would be feeling it as much as I did. Um, because I, you know, I was kind of holding, trying to, you know, take care of my mom too, and keep her calm down from all that, you know, worry and stress. Because, you know, it's, you don't know. Like, I think it's the water thing that really gets you the most um, cause you could be without power or internet or phone, which is not fun, but when you're without power and on a well system or it has been affected by the damage in the infrastructure, that means no water and no water is, is very serious because you can, you know, it's not long before you're dead without water. And then it, it was the, actually the contamination issues that concern me when I heard about the, um, you know, the big gosh, Irwin, Tennessee and the businesses that had the radioactive radioactive waste and other things that are very toxic to be in the environment downstream that are now in the waters. And that's actually downstream from us, but that was actually the biggest concern, I think, with even in Asheville, there's a lot of people who still don't have running water that's that's clean, really. So they have to boil it or filter it. And luckily, I do have running water because I have a well. So anyway, I, I don't want to go on about that, but I was warned in dreams also about um, the water issue and the contamination issues to be mindful of not not and this is not just bugs like we think of oh you know like you know the usual things that give you traveler's diarrhea that kind of thing but i'm talking about radiological and um, chemical and extreme toxins that are very bad so i was i was concerned about that but on the other note that i remember what i had forgotten when I was just got on a roll. Um, there still are mountain communities that haven't gotten help in a month and that people are still attending to and trying to find. So, and they're in higher elevations or some of the, just the more remote places. There's just a lot of really remote places out here. So, and they're hard to get to because the roads might've flooded out and the people can't communicate. So even now I found that for example, I had like one or two bars, one bar on my cell phone, 
you know, cellular, whatever, because the, they're still screwed up. Right. <laughs> and then I had an Amazon delivery or something. And then they had to call me on my phone and they were, we were only like four miles away. And then our phone still didn't work to get a clear connection for him to even call me about a delivery that was like only a four mile distance. So those kind of things. So it's disrupting a lot. I think the, the, the disruption itself, you know, people hear about on the news and, oh, you know, it's over in, in a week or two for the regular people who are in the thing. But this is this is going to go on for months and months for for the disruptions and the, and the rebuilding and um, really the acceptance of um I think it's the acceptance of realizing this is this is the beginning of of things that are to come in many different areas, and it's part of a whether or not it's the weather changes that are coming from you know these cosmic you know solar system or the planet X and all that, or we don't know really. Um, so I've heard that we're, there was meteors actually in Spain because one of the people I'm corresponding with. Um, lives in Spain. They were talking about the Valencia flood. It's pretty severe. And that happened in a short period of time, like eight hours, they got a whole year's worth of rain. <laughs> so they were going through the same thing. And what was interesting is the Spanish people, they're very, um, they're, they're more passionate and vocal about how they feel. So their reactions to the government when I guess, I don't know what they would call them. He's they kind of have a monarchy kind of thing in, in Spain. But I guess when they visited him and his wife visited Valencia, you know, people were just throwing mud at him and, and they had to leave because they were so mad at like um how the rescue help was delayed or they just not enough. And I think that's the same we that you know what was the stall all about? And I think it's a lot of it's bureaucratic. Um you know, the local people tend to know the area well and can respond faster if they have the resources. So yeah. there seems to have been a deliberate stand down uh, once again there in the aftermath of all this. Uh, they had plenty of assets there. Uh, I was uh, reading an account or hearing about an account where this guy came up to uh, U.S. Air Force uh, PJs, uh, Par Parajumper Rescues, right? Uh types and they're there they're there in front of their helicopter but they're not being deployed so they're as useless as you know pardon the Anunnaki uh, as useful as tits on a toad right <laughs> and f yeah. for those who don't think that the military under any administration would not do harm to their own citizens they haven't been paying attention this is not the same military of yesteryear. This is entirely changed over uh, on a perfect world, which is, this is far from a perfect world. The new administration will sweep away every last vestige of Luciferianism, Bolshevism, wokeness, et cetera, but that's not going to happen. If they can get out enough of them and, and mm. replace them with people that have, you know, like a human soul, we, we might start to trend in the right direction point of relevance is those military types, those uh, Air Force PJs, pararescue jumpers, they could have said, oh, F with the stand down orders. We're going to do what's right, right? But the problem is so many of these military types are paradigmatic thinkers. They only think in one way or the other, follow orders. The government narrative is always the correct one. They're going to take the path of least resistance. And just like water, which always takes the path of least resistance, eventually to be dropped off at its lowest point. So that's what we're mm -hmm. going to see eventually with, you know, the military they're, and the police. They're just going to follow orders. So I think what people one takeaway from the outside looking in from what you and many others over there have endured is absolutely preparedness. Uh, Mike Adams is always talking about preparedness mm -hmm. on his show. Yeah. So uh, it's just terrible what went on over there. And the fact that people up in the mountains are still without power, without resources, what have you, uh, kudos to Craig and uh, his team and others like his that went way up there on horseback looking to help people, looking to find people, what have you. And that's the one good thing, silver lining that has come out of this was 
to see communities come together and people helping people instead of waiting uh, for the authorities, the feds to arrive. Uh, instead, they became a hindrance, if anything, right, as usual. So it's just a lesson in resilience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I thought I was prepped. And then when my generator broke after the fourth day, and then I realized I wasn't prepped in in the ways that I thought I would for like cooking meals. And um, and but luckily, you know, within two days after that, our power did return. Uh, so, you know, and then some, some things that I bought through prepper channels, even one of them was like a crank up radio. And the other one was this like solar powered water heater thing that looks cool. It's like this big thermos thing. I won't say where I got them, but they were useless. I mean, the crank radio worked for a bit because we had to rely on radio to get to, to get news until I had enough of it, internet or the data on my phone to even give me in when I started watching the YouTube channels. So I know I, I probably should get over this, but initially like, oh, I can get a, a radio and hear a radio, I think it's an FM channel that was actually really good and giving updates on people and where they were at and what they needed and people were helping people. But then when you came with the official news station, there's like an official TV station, news station, even the official radio stations, they were keeping a low, they were not really allowing in the discussion of what we were hearing about, like from our friend Craig with the the FEMA and the stand downs and the, um, you know, the stonewalling of, of supplies and how come they weren't helping people and, you know, like things that were happening that they just weren't talking about and they weren't willing to talk about. And so I got so angry since I just stopped listening to the radio because once I was able to get along online again and talk to the, see the real people who are really doing the reports. And there was a really good show. I think it's the Sean Ryan show. Is that his name? He's really famous. Um, and he inter interviewed, the, I think it was the bear guy, the two rescuers who were like ex black op, you know, super duper, you know, hero types. And then hearing like the real, the real stories of the rescues with the people in the helicopters. And, and that, that was like, wow, you know, and, um, but I don't want to have it like an anti-government sentiment or anything. It's just that when, when bureaucracies get so large, they get in their own way and then they can't really be as efficient as a small team to get something done. And that's where like our communities are our best hope and our, our relationships and our communities. And, and that, that was a wake up call because, I think so many of us have become isolated. Well, I don't know, people in our, let's say our interest groups, uh, whatever you want to call that, it, we talk about the normies versus the ones who are awake or we think we're awake or about the other things going on behind the scenes that others don't know about, you know, such as um, the reality of human trafficking and mind control and the ones who are running the show and hijacking many different sectors of society and keeping this human trafficking situation going to enable the predators and the larger predators that are still working through certain high power groups of people. Okay. So if people don't know that, that we've got a problem because no, no problems will ever be solved unless they can get to the root of um, the cause of what I think is the corruption, um, which runs large bureaucracies and large groups. And anyway, so I'll stop there because you know, I can go on and on and on about, you know, how can we solve this, you know, but. The reason I brought it up was, you know, this is the first real chance we've had to talk since all this. I was quite worried having lost comms with you. And I, I'm not going to get on a government bashing tirade either. But once again, it's just the follow the orders mentality that I, I would like to have seen more of an effort and also the people that did get involved with the bureaucracies rather um, authority institutions there was not enough people with a can-do attitude uh, small groups of private people with uh, land moving equipment what have you went up into the some of those rural areas and did wonders they, they reopened roads they cleared debris they helped find people they helped find you know, deceased people because you know, the powers that be had no interest. And it reminds me of the discussions. I, I don't remember if you actually spoke or corresponded. Uh, what was her name? Katie Lang. Uh, she was the one that survived uh, Hurricane Andrew. And uh, her. Oh, Mikovich. 
Yeah, Katie, Katie Smith. Yes, yes. yes. Well, mm-hmm. she talked about even before Hurricane Andrew hit, there were already these spooky black yeah. uniforms, SWAT type troops all over the place with, with you know, their government vans and they'd sealed off the peninsula and then they hammered Florida with Hurricane Andrew, which was artificially generated. The media yeah, trapped her. The yeah, media I mean, I totally downplayed the number of casualties. There were casualties in the thousands, but they deliberately lied about the the sheer number of, of fatalities. So I think that it's something similar to what just happened. We're never going to get an actual count of just think of all the places that were hit with directed energy weapons and burnt to a crisp. Yeah. We'll never get an accurate accounting of all those people that were there. They're just gone. They're just written off the history books. Right. And so that's, it, it cycles back to what I said at the outset that if I didn't know any better and not to sound glass half full, this is or glass half empty. Rather, this is just an observation it, if I didn't know any better, the, the country was being lopped off and, and segmented, uh, yeah. turning you know areas where there's likely to be some degree of resistance, uh, mm. trying to render them uninhabitable, right? Mm-hmm. Huge swaths of uh, uh, states getting burned up. Still, it's it's we're under attack. This is the full spectrum dominance attack now before we shift gears and talk about other things give the the listeners and viewers your review about what starlink is and and forgive me for my ignorance i don't really know what starlink is is that a means to get on the internet well yeah i mean i didn't find out until i heard that because all the internet and cellular phone towers had gone out uh, and people didn't have communication in Asheville, for example and I think it was Elon Musk, you know, made an effort to give um, pros. So I don't know if you can hear me. Um, yeah. So I, then I heard about it. I said, well, what's that? And then someone told me the website. Well, if you're in the in the disaster area and these you can get a i thought i can get a a free one (laughs) but you got i got a discount for 30 days and so you just buy like this big panel and and then a couple other devices and hook it up to your phone as long as you get the app and the website to get the location so it's cooked up to the satellites that are already in space to make the connection with the internet so there's enough satellites now, I guess, to do internet connections once you have the Starlink set up instead of a regular Wi-Fi router and all that stuff. So that that was helpful. I mean, I had to pay for mine, but um, otherwise, I still would ha- I would be without internet even now. And and the phone, and it's like I couldn't do some serious legal things because of my um, internet and cell phone outage. So like, you know, when you have to deal with like court cases and communications and jobs and you're like oh i'm sorry i can't do it because i'm in a disaster and they don't really care if you're in a disaster or not you just missed your court date you know what i mean so <laughs> yeah they're still fighting you and you know it's still somehow, some, some, somehow the reminder letters get through you know it's like geez what what is yeah. this right well it's just like uh, uh when you're in a survival thing where i like, like um you can't worry about like what the chatter is on this or that or like all your priorities completely change and then as facts we got the feeling of what it feels like to be in a second or third world country where we're we're fighting to have clean water and food and power and not knowing you know what your next day or week is going to be and 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 then the feeling of um, need and having to beg and not really getting what you're begging for sometimes um and then the feelings you get, let's say, of foreigners who've been in third world countries, the attitude that Americans have had, it just kind of overlook their needs and what they... The complacency uh, and the apathy that, that yeah, set in. It's just like, um, like the value system. We realize, oh my God, people's value systems are screwed up. Like there's people who own several homes. They live okay. They're not rich, but they're not poor and hurting. And they still don't give... Uh, 
to people who, if you don't give, they can die. So like, it, there's something wrong with this equation. And then you start to realize this is serious. This is like, how could people be so self-absorbed in what they have and what they do to, to not understand that there's people's lives at stake that, are, that may come to an early end and actually have an effect on them and their family, but they're, they're so self-absorbed that they have no idea, no idea that their selfishness and their whatever it is doesn't take into consideration that, you know, in your neighborhood, you know, you, you're next, you can be next, <laughs> you better be careful. So, yeah. That's what this and other similar events have shown that any one of us could be struck with these challenges instantly overnight in, in no way would I compare what I've gone through with what happened over there. It's what happened over there was many times worse orders of magnitude, but there were two occasions in particular where I'm at where we were absolutely hit with weather weaponry. There's no doubt in my mind from my professional understanding of all this, right? The weather weaponry, what have you, the capabilities, which they've had these capabilities for some time now. We were cut off in a small beach town community. There were city buses that were trapped. They couldn't go forward. They couldn't go back. These were uh, narrow, winding, mountainous roads. Only two ways to get in and out of these two beachside communities. And we had to walk through that, right? I, and I would look up and the tops of trees were swaying. The wind was just wow. crazy didn't have power and i i think that people like us and knowing what you know we have to at some point even though it's difficult and the resentment can build up when we think about it but when we know this is geoengineered when we know this is a deliberate attack on on people and on the countryside in a specific locale Sometimes we have to just get on with the problem. We can't just wallow in the fact, oh, this is geo-weaponry, this is bio-weaponry, this is weather weaponry, woe is me. It's like, pal, you're in a combat zone now. Exactly. You know, the, combat, the combat veterans in Afghanistan and Iraq may take issue with that. But if mm. we as citizens are under geoengineering attack, bio-weapons attack, they're opening the sluices of dams, I mean, I mean, in World War II, the Royal Air Force deliberately bombed the largest dams in the Ruhr Valley, and they, they lied about the casualties the German civilians um, suffered from that. Oh, only about a thousand people. The, the Ruhr Valley is one of the most populated places to this day, and they deliberately wow. targeted these large uh, dams, and, and they flooded large parts of the Ruhr Valley and the people in it. Right. So this no notion that they only killed about a thousand people. By by yeah. you know putting holes in these dams, that's nonsense. That's right? where being a historian counts. Like if you can get the true witness testimonies of people in the area, or the the histories that you don't hear about that are in the, like the private journals and stuff, then you can get a different look at history and how history has definitely been tweaked to, you know, enable the victors or the predators or whoever they are to kind of not really let you know what it means when you're in a war and what, how to act and how to prepare yourself. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of people I think are not prepared, but sometimes you can't prepare for some things. Like um, there's some people who may be prepped and, but they couldn't, you know, get everything in their house when it was going to be washed out in 15 minutes and they had no idea. So there's a lot of things that some people just can't prepare for and you just, you know, do your best but this whole thing about war, and um, I'm learning a lot, not only from you, actually, over the years, um, because of your study of military history, but learning from others. Um, like, there's actually a Christian guy, um, Dave Hodges had him on a show, uh, Jamie Walden. I think he's a pastor also, but he's like an ex-Marine and does um, rescues and, you know, was in Afghanistan, all these countries. So he knows, like, high-level operations in war and how to think strategically and how to prepare strategically and know the enemy so that you know how to perform under these conditions and to survive and most people don't have a clue and um, that's kind of scary it's like um, if you don't know how they operate uh, and that just kind of goes back to 
understanding how they operate and, and knowing intuitively, I hate to sound paranoid, but if you could intuitively really pick up, I hate to say it, who is your enemy, okay? So who is operating under those conditions that bring that sense up inside you, like this predatory enemy feeling, um, then you have to nurture your your connection with the truth inside so that you can tune in. Like I was tuning in and just praying that I was getting dreams. Okay. So that's how I do it. And sometimes actually just talking to somebody who has more knowledge than me also helps so that I can be appropriately prepared because I have a sense on things like, okay, I have a sense that this is not like I knew before this storm, it wasn't just going to be a storm. And this was a, uh, in my dream, it was, um, I don't want to go into details, but it was like fending off the power of Levi Leviathan in a, in a region and that it had its authority to do what it was doing, but only maybe in a certain way or with certain people or certain things. And so it was a way to protect and, if I could, this power of Leviathan that was going to come sweeping through the region. So um, that's what I picked up spiritually, which was kind of weird, you know, and I didn't expect to, but that's what I picked up. But, yeah. Everything that happens, just about everything that happens in our physical world, it was preceded by a thought or an action or something in the, the spirit world, right? Thoughts are things, thoughts are manifested essentially and drawn in from essentially the spirit world. So because we're kind of antennas, two-way antennas, we can pick up on these things or guidance of the divine, God, call it what one will, has this way at times if we're open and receptive to it to receive these kinds of messages. I've had many dreams in the past of tsunamis, of floods, of uh, things of that nature, and many other people have had similar dreams as well. So it's our super consciousness picking up on possibilities, probabilities, possible future timelines, possible future outcomes, kind of girding us and, and prepping us for what may come about. In the time you got left, uh, you were just touching on issues a moment ago and, and earlier in our conversation about the hardcore issues that uh, people are still oblivious to, right? This You talk about the Leviathan spirit, which is a predatory spirit, essentially. So everything that played out in Western North Carolina, Eastern Tennessee, elsewhere, that had its origins in the minds of some twisted demonic people or people or beings that pass for people, and then they have the means and resources to bring it into reality. And, and here we are. What's your intuitive sense as far as what may be coming down the pike in the not too distant future? Well, I mean, if I wanted to clarify, like I'm trying to get a deeper understanding of, um, I think depending on where we're at with our, let's say our connection with the most high, I for me, it's through Christ and it works that way and it's eternal. Um, then there's a transcendent, always a higher, higher authority that is good that from a transcendent perspective, everything's like playing out. And then there's lower authorities that have the ability or the spiritual permissions to carry out whatever they're doing according to another plan, depending on the people and their alliances and where they're at with whatever, what we're here to do and be and what we align with and what values that we want to hold. So in my dream, um, and this actually accords to spiritual warfare um, principles that the more, let's say, the more open doors we have of things we're holding on to that we should let go of, like if it's unforgiveness or resentment or vanity or pride or, you know, the, the sins or whatever, if we're holding on to these things or, or unresolved trauma or whatever it is, then that gives a, an authority over these other forces to basically mess with you. So if we can clean out what's in ourselves and in our community and we can work with prayer, then that can help alleviate uh, what could have just destroyed your entire home. And so that's what it was shown to me. And in the dream, there was several who were praying all together, like 
it was really a, a really weird actually but it worked because um there was peace and there was stillness even though we you could feel the force inside the water inside the waves coming i felt the peace on top of the water through the through the people who we were all praying and what needed to be released to maintain the peace to basically you know we're a surfer i'm surfing was surfing over that one and that was a, that was a lucky i mean i thought that was a grace of god um but in terms of things coming, I feel like there's going to be more roller coaster things because it's, it seems like it's part of our um, era in history. And, and, you know, in some ways, I think I believe it's sifting the wheat from the chaff. And, you know, we have to decide, are we going to discern? Are we going to really be able to discern what's in our midst? Let's you're on the battlefield or something. And you have to discern in a moment's notice based on this pure intuition or experience that comes to you what to do in any moment because you can perceive the intentions and capabilities of a potential enemy or force and so it's really learning how to connect with that ability and that ability to connect with absolute truth of discernment inside of us and that that to me is like well that's an internal process a lot of times that's internal but also skill and experience you know in these situations yeah those are things that we can all do individually and no amount of youtube uh channel hopping is going to bring that kind of desired outcome that sense of peace that sense of awareness that sense of uh, balance on what may right that can only be garnered from doing the kind of work you suggested uh just endless youtube channel hopping and endless workshops from this that or the other guru is, isn't going to do it someone has to be at peace eventually with himself because if they have to be recept they have to be receptive right which means yeah. that the inner turmoil uh has to be uh you know subdued to a point to allow that kind of you know connection to yeah. be made so one thing that I've taken away from all this is that any moment, once again, we could find ourselves in these mm -hmm. types of scenarios. Uh, they're making a point of like wiping the slate clean, so to speak, uh, for mm -hmm. these places designated to be 15 minute smart cities, what have you. And, you know, going forward, if the economy just keeps you know, falling off a cliff like it's been doing and and these wars and rumors of wars expand, we can begin to see all kinds of turmoil, unrest, what have you, in in America. Uh, because, mm -hmm. you know, we ne we've never seen this kind of division. Now, the, pe the people have spoken. There's a lot more of us than them, right? That's one takeaway from this, another takeaway, that there's a lot more people that have common sense, account, self accountability, self worth, guidance of the divine, than there are of these whack jobs. But these whack jobs are everywhere, and yeah. uh, you know what they've managed to do with this cultural Marxism, which has infected all strata of society, is they've turned people against each other. They've made people bitter enemies. Uh, they've turned people into zealots and fanatics. It's not difficult to do. So there's definitely a spiritual component behind all this. So we'll delve into more of that in uh, the member segment. Uh, Evie, if you want to give our listeners and viewers uh, information on how they can find you and your work. Um, well, I, I keep it simple now. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm not on Facebook, and I know you've mentioned that, but I prefer just to do X, Twitter, and um, Telegram and my own website and Sometimes I post on LinkedIn and um, that's about it really. And just email. And so, yeah, I'm hoping to work on a new article and I've done some um, in Spanish and Italian um, in the past month, I believe. So those are actually pretty good. And we could talk a little bit more about that in the next segment on some of those things. Um, yeah. So that's simple. Cool. And to our dear listeners and viewers out there, if you like what we do, if you believe in what we do, Please go to thecosmicswitchboard.com, sign up, become a member, and we'll see you at the top of the next segment.